integrated model, very uh, specialized, some of the parts. We do have this, we call it uh, halal almas, which is the incentive that we give to investor in halal park, which is not a dedicated halal park. Eh? So we thought the uh, halal park, uh, unique halal park, is something that you know we need to move on because we are looking at the transparency in the supply chain. This is a problem with the halal. Eh? The logo is beautiful, but behind the logo, there's so many things which is not being attended to, and we, we, are, we like to address the shortcoming in the supply chain and value chain to the special halal part. Eh? Now, my question is, on the cost of land, and I'm glad this has uh, been raised in your report. Uh, anyway, your report is fantastic. I think this is uh, quite an insight because uh, being something new to do to part development, I'm lost, and you know, uh, and, and this is something which I thought uh, you have thrown out. Uh, you, know, uh, you, you have highlighted some good points. Now, the issue here is the cost of land. This, this is the question I'm asking. Uh, there are two aspects you're, you're mentioning. One is on the larger ecosystem, where you, the price of land over the other factors which can bring investors in, in terms of GNI or in terms of, you know, the cost of land could be small. But to an operator or to an investor who is investing into a park, the cost of land is a very, very important factor. You, you mentioned in all your economic analysis, uh, as I've seen it. So my issue here is a lot of this strategic land are, are given, are being privatized. For example, you look at uh, in Johor, uh, I remember uh, the big one that ended up in and that's why I'm working with uh, NSTEC. Uh, you see, when you give the land to the private sector, they have bumped up the cost because they do business with the land. And to, for an investor to come in, the cost of land can be quite prohibitive because, um, uh, because they have to make money. We move in as a power operator, we want to make money. They have to bring the investor in. They also have to look at their, their, their requirement. Now, the issue here now, the question now, is isn't, isn't it uh, proper for the government to issue the land, to be the land owner? Because the government will look at the bigger picture in terms of uh, employment, in terms of GNI, and so on and so forth. At the same time, uh, like you see, there's an equation that if you, if you are 70% short, 30% uh, short, that 30% could be coming from the government to fund. So I think I think depend on how strategic the investment is, whether in terms of attracting investment, because let's say halal, I, I would take it halal as our indigenous technology. I mean, this is something God given that uh, the world is listening to Malaysia, but we are not really capitalizing on halal as a as a big package in terms of uh, industry development, and we have a lot of strength in it, in terms of not just certification, but in terms of understanding the, the whole halal supply chain. So. For a newcomer for me to invest into a, into a part of this sort, where the price of land is very high, I think it can be quite, you know, discouraging. And I have an international partner who is interested to invest in halal, and his concern is also on the cost of land. So the factors of the halal part is such that I'm, I'm not too sure how to move from here. So the issue now is, my question is, do you think the park development in terms of land should be government land? Maybe it could even be for free, you know? Uh, and also, then they are part of the incentive. It's not covered on the incentive. Uh, how, you know, example like, like Skandar, there's a big incentive. There's a certain part that we know the incentive are, are slightly lesser than the Skandar. There's a different in the incentive uh, scheme, you know. So, which is which now? Which is the, the strategy investment we are looking at to give the better incentive? So, this is the sort of issue I think uh, we need to address. Thank you. Very interesting question and a complex question. The first part of my answer is, in this business, never generalize. There is not one single truth. In sometimes, the price, the cost of land is indeed prohibitive to the return of investment of a project, and therefore one should be extremely careful. In many cases, we have seen throughout the arithmetics that we made, that in Malaysia, and with reference to a number of projects, the cost of land is not at all prohibitive in the equation. We all know that there are three ways of pricing something. You can be competitive, you can do competitive pricing, you can say, let's have a look at what the competition is asking for a square foot of land, and let's position ourselves according to what the competition is doing. You can do cost, 
based pricing. You can look at what the cost was to develop the land and then say, if this is the cost, let's make a little profit and therefore that is the pricing. Or you can do value-based pricing. What is this land worth for the one that comes here and does business? That's the way you should do it. And therefore, case by case, you should be very careful not to be in a situation whereby the price of land is prohibitive. If that is the case, you should be very careful with your pricing. And you may even go under the cost price of your land in order to be able to attract. So answer number one is, let's see whether it is a situation of very price sensitive or not at all. It's what we refer to as elasticity, price elasticity. Second part of the answer is specifically related to halal. I am absolutely convinced that the halal market is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous opportunity and, and therefore is definitely something to really look at and to see how you can capture industries, activities, and so forth uh, that are uh, in this market. You mentioned yourself that in Halal, a very important element is the transparency of logistics. And therefore, like we discussed land costs and the impact on the return on investment, Equally important, or probably much more important for halal, is how important in the equation for the investor is the transport cost. The more important transport cost is, the more difficult this transparency can be brought to the project. And therefore, you will have to look for projects for which the price elasticity of transport in the total equation is minimal. And that's where you will be able to be successful. At the same time, of course, again, you should not come up with land prices that are prohibited. Third part of the answer, shouldn't we, shouldn't we keep the ownership of the land in the hand of the government and maybe instead of ask for a concession or a rental, even give it for free? There are uh, two views on this. One view is that for certain locations, like for example in port areas or airport areas, those locations are of such strategic importance to a country and we do not know what a port will look like 100 years from now or 150 years from now. Six, seven years ago, we believed that container ships of 6,000 tons were big ones. Today we are building 14,000. So nobody knows what those things will look like 100 years from now. That school says that land we should never sell. We should keep it in our own hands as a government and we should only give a concession. The other school is companies that say if we invest several hundred millions of dollars in a project, we want to be the owner of the land and we do not just want please them. Is the one right? Is the other one right? There is no <coughs> correct answer. There are two views on that. In the summary, I think that is the answer to your question. Uh, I was involved in uh, promoting those uh, investments in the electrical and electronics industry. I think uh, when I first saw your first conclusion, uh, rather shocking. That's uh, how I felt. I do not know whether the whole exercise you know, should be uh, fine or uh, look at it in more details. But definitely, if you talk about uh, access of this uh, industrial land, if you just look at it from the statistics point of view, I'm not sure whether the figure is uh, correct or it is uh, reflective of the actual situation. But definitely, I think in terms of relevance to the respective industries, that in good in good demand now at this moment or those industries that we want to promote now, I don't think you know we have sufficient uh, ready industrial land uh, to what we can offer to the investor. Now I don't want to go into the details on statistics. I just quote a few uh, recent announcement. Number one, the Panasonic when they chose the Panasonic Solar when they chose Kulin the lot two in the phase one. 
for the site, that is about 62 acres. Uh, I believe uh, from Kulin could uh, confirm with that. I think the reason quoted why they chose Kulin is because that land, the piece of land, actually was earlier reserved for another multinational company. And then that is readily available for them to start construction immediately. And they are planning to start a production actually end of uh, this year. So the uh, main reason they chose Kulin because lands with in good infrastructure and uh, meet their what they call selection criteria close to the port and all that uh, uh, fit in very well and that's why uh, they made that decision now number two the second uh, latest uh, announcement in Saramban Sanayan uh, uh, what they call industrial park you notice that Daihatsu has just uh, uh, announced a project to make this electronics uh, transmission they bought 28 acres of land the same reason quoted that is the place where they can find a huge piece of land ready for construction and they chose 28 acres first and they have extra uh, quite a huge piece of uh, land uh, next to it for their future uh, expansion uh, that shows that uh, a lot of projects uh, nowadays uh, they are looking for suitable location uh, generally it should be say uh, i would say within a one to one and a half hours uh, what we call drive from the port or airport. And the main two important enablers actually is the port facility and the airport. So if you look at all these factors, a lot of other what we call uh, industrial estate developed many years ago, actually there is uh, not much demand in, uh, in relation to the present uh, needs of new investors. Especially the present needs of new investors, they come in with high technology which the government uh, is trying to promote. Uh, they need all the what we call the best infrastructures available, not only in terms of air cargo, sea cargo, uh, land transport, but also the what we call the very good infrastructure, dual what we call power supply, dual uh, direct access, road access, and uh, telecommunication. Because nowadays they need what we call what we call uh, connection with the uh, uh, global uh, network and all that. So uh, the those uh, industrial uh, park uh, developed earlier was more catering for, I would say, 20 years ago was more for the assembly operation. Today we are talking about high-tech industry. It's a very completely different scenario. It's a different type of infrastructure you need to provide. And you have to get it ready because they are looking around, shopping around all over the world, and they are looking for readily available uh, industrial land for them to make a decision. And they will go in and start construction immediately. They are not going to wait for you. And after signing the agreement, only you start the land development. We have uh, experienced so many rounds. Serengon Science Park, we have experience, you know, before that it was basically just an oil palm estate. And people came in, you know, we have to bring them to show them the place, uh, even to a helicopter. I mean, these are some of the what we call the experience that gone through. So we feel that you now it's important that we quickly, you know, what we call develop more what we call uh, new industrial park with the present that can address the infrastructure needs and uh, for the present breed of uh, investors uh, that we are trying to promote. Uh, that is on one point. I have many other issues actually it will take uh, quite some time if I want to explain exactly the whole picture. But the other thing is about this uh, revitalization of existing industrial park. Now there are many old industrial parks, for example, uh, Shah Alam or even uh, Bayan Pass. Look what about those uh, wagon factories? Now there are a lot of new uh, industrial parks being what we call uh, converted into for uh, different uh, what we call usage, turned into commercial centers and that kind of thing. Recently, I think uh, last week you saw probably you all, uh, remember there was a report. Paramount Corporation bought the expansion Kuala Lumpur 30 acres uh, factory with 30 acres land for 125 million. That comes to about work out to about 100 ringgit per square foot. But that kind of investment is more for what we call turning into a commercial, uh, what we call usage. But in order to for us to invite high tech industry, which require you know, 30 acres or 50 acres of land, which is very common now, 100 over million of uh, what we call uh, cost, what we call investment on the land itself, definitely what we call discourage uh, such uh, projects of coming to Malaysia. So we have to address this issue about this uh, pricing mechanism and how we look at you know, uh, pricing based on a total development opportunity. You see, normally in uh, the industrial estate should be developed together with an integrated township or city development. 
You cannot just uh, base on selling the industrial land and try to recover the cost of development. It has to what we call uh, factor in the what we call the benefits you will get from the what we call the development of the surrounding area. You will best to have a big developer say uh, having four or five thousand acres, say about one thousand acres of industrial. Then the others, you know, they will want the benefit from uh, selling uh, land at a higher price for residential or commercial development. So there's always this need of cross subsidy for the industrial land. Otherwise, it's impossible to what we call attract all these uh, investors to come in. So I'm rather what we call uh, uh, perplexed as to why you only look at what we call uh, industrial uh, land pricing based on what we call the cost, and uh, rather than looking at it from an integrated approach. You see, the government may have to subsidize. You accept that you have to factor in the other benefits that you will get uh, from uh, all this investment. Another point is about the weightage, you see. In most of these uh, the multinational companies, uh, global site selection, they always uh, provide what they got, uh, they give weightage on the various factors. Whether it's a uh, labor cost, whether it's what they call uh, transportation cost, land cost, uh, everything. Uh, there's always a uh, different weightage. Of course, a uh, different area, uh, in different industrial uh, area, you have to provide a different weightage you know, for you to work out the, what we call uh, pricing uh, mechanism. Now in this uh, Jenga triangle, there is uh, one, one, one the Japanese company, Alps Electronics. They are operating with 2,000 acres and pro producing one of the what we call a leading electronics component. And there is in the Jenga triangle. But they were, they were landed there those days when we were trying to spread out the, what we call the industrial as part. Uh, investment into all over the country. Even in Jenga, there is such a Jenga industrial estate. And else is one of the example. 2,000 workers and op still operating there. And even with a design center there. But what are the factors that make them remain there? Basically because they have the ecosystem, or right? their workers, you know, all the territory, because the workers are already, uh, uh, they have employed the workers for so many years, they need them to continue with the operation. But look at new investment. We have to look at uh, the, what we call differentiate between new investment and all those uh, what you call expansion or diversification from existing uh, investors. Now, new investment, the selection is much uh, more what we call uh, comprehensive. They look at the various factors. As I said, they look for land, you know, uh, area where it is maybe one to one and a half hours from the port or from the airport, highway access and that kind of thing. Now, for expansion, it's different, you see. They look for land. Nearby, for example, many uh, multinational companies in, in Penang, uh, they like to what you call, uh, if you can find uh, a piece of land and buy a bus, definitely they don't like paying a little bit more. Uh, you, you can price it uh, higher because you know they have the ecosystem already established there. So that is a different factor you have to also look here. And uh, the other thing is about what you call, uh, even uh, foreign companies are coming into Malaysia, actually uh, buying up those uh, industrial properties and offer what we call uh, leasing back to these uh, what we call existing uh, uh, investors. And here uh, we uh, in Malaysia we do not have such a what we call uh, industrial property stockist. I would call it even land bank stockist. You know, uh, we we should have a land land bank stockist that that collect or what we call acquire or buy up all those uh, industrial land or property as suitable. Uh, what we call location, so that we can offer to the right investors are uh, coming in. Uh, if those are the target investment that we are looking at, you see. Without that, you know, uh, we do not uh, catch all these uh, good projects. We cannot catch all those good projects to come in because we cannot offer them the best location to meet their needs. Okay, thank you. Okay, so like many dimensions, but the one that we, we said quantitatively. Uh, there is an indication, there is an oversupply from the data that we, we, we have gathered. But I want to uh, pass on to Thank you one by one. Uh, you mentioned that the first conclusion is a shocking conclusion and refer, you refer to the oversupply. Um, in fact, our first conclusion is the lack of information that leads us to believe there is a great oversupply. Remember, we talk about 595 estates, industrial estates. For um, 129, we tried to get into the details and to 
um, come to um, a view on what is available and what the quality is and what the cost structures are, we only succeeded to deal with 39, 39. And the conclusions we formulated are based on a linear projection from the, what we see on the 39 to the 595. In other words, when we say there is a land bank of 53 billion, that's only a projection on what we saw on the sample of which we know what we talk about. In other words, when you mentioned in your question, I'm not sure that this is correct, that is our remark. Nobody is sure. We only looked at one sample of which we know, we know what we talk about because we looked at it, we have the information and so forth. The sample is small. If you apply that to the 595, first of all, the dramatic conclusion or the shocking conclusion is there is a lack of information. Secondly, the conclusion is if what we see for those that we really know what we talk about is the same as for the others, then there is a huge amount of money involved that is sleeping and there is an overcapacity. Thirdly, uh, part and then um, I come to your uh, example of Panasonic. We very well stated in our conclusions that the issue is not demand and supply as such, but the issue is supply that answers the needs of the industrialists. And there I fully agree with your comment. The industrialists today ask a number of things, a number of combination of things that are such that the ones that really answer those needs, there is not an oversupply. In total, there is an oversupply. In fact, what we are facing is a classroom of many, many students, but with probably only a small number of good students. That is the situation. So um, in, in the conclusion, maybe there is a misunderstanding between the shocking finding of oversupply versus the shocking finding of underinformation, leading us to believe that. That is the first answer to the first question. Secondly, your second question is, uh, why should an investment, or why should an industrial estate, why do you look at it in this very simplified way? What is it costing? and what is it bringing to us, and if there is a gap, it's a bad idea. I don't think I said that. I said that there are two situations possible. An industrial estate can generate enough money to recover the investments that are made, and then you have a situation with no problem. You can always find money to finance. It generates enough money to repay the investment. Where you refer to cross-subsidization and where you refer to the example where there is even the need for uh, a complete development to support high tech, this is where I mentioned if you are in the other situation where there is not enough future money made in order to find the investment back up front, the government has to come with funding the difference in English between funding and financing. The government can come to close the gap. That's exactly what we say in our conclusions. But there should be other reasons than project-related return of investment then. And those other region, reasons can be macroeconomic reasons, such as employment creation, such as return to government, and such as value added created for the entire economy. So I don't think we disagree on that point. Exactly what you mentioned, we took over in our conclusions. The only thing we say is just spend the money just like that. First of all, only, good, uh, only look at the good students in the class, the ones that answers the needs of the industrialists today. And maybe you don't need 595 all over the country, but you need a limited number that is well qualified and not the proper cost structure. And secondly, how much is the cost? How much does it bring? Is there a gap? And is there a gap? 
do we see reasons enough to bridge the gap? That is what we find in our conclusions, and that is exactly, I believe, what you just traced, and we fully agree with, with, with that approach and with that conclusion. Except we don't say, just spend it because there is land, develop it because we can develop, that's the wrong approach. But I don't think we fundamentally differ in view on your second question. Your third question, uh, there you say, uh, be careful because the companies work with weighted factors. They weigh labor costs, they weigh transport costs. I disagree. Companies weigh the importance of labor availability. They weigh the importance of the proximity of a port or an airport. They weigh the quality of, and so forth. For some activities, proximity of a port is much more important than for others. For some activities, international connections with flags are much more important than others. That's where they weigh. And in fact, in our approach, we have weighed the quality issues when we looked at Malaysia and its industrial estates. We have weighed them. Where I do not agree with you, or maybe where I misunderstood you, is where you say they weigh the cost factors. No. A labor cost in Malaysia is a labor cost. And a land cost is a land cost. One company, one project may need 2,000 people, and another one only 50, and therefore one time you multiply 2,000 by a yearly labor cost and another time 50. And one company may need one hectare and another one need, may need 50 hectares. That's not weighted, that's calculated. So yes, there is an issue of weighing and there is an issue of different shades of gray when it comes to quality issues. We have taken that approach into account throughout our study. When it comes to cost structures, there is the issue of calculating. And that's exactly the approach we have used. And on your fourth question, which relates to information, I fully agree with your point. Uh, I'm Hyrule Kiki Osman from Kulimha Park. Uh, I would like to uh, touch a bit on the uh, KPIs. Right? Uh, as mentioned by John uh, in his uh, speech as now, that uh, all industrial estates shouldn't be competing each other in Malaysia. But uh, that was about 10 years ago, whereby uh, when Kulin, Johor, Selangor, even Malacca is good buddies. And uh, we always talk to each other, you know, try to. Uh, it, it, Try to uh, pass around the investors whether the country should go to Kulimha Airport or Johor should take the investors and so on. But ever since the KPI systems comes in, uh, usually when industrial estate come with the KPIs, they will come with the uh, target of selling of land, for example, in terms of acreage or probably in terms of uh, dollars and cents. So uh, when this system KPIs comes in, it actually invites the uh, competition among each other, right? Especially if you look at the statistic, probably Islam will be the, the highest uh, competition for each other because they have about half of the industrial estate uh, from Malaysia. But then, uh, in the real case scenario, uh, one investor has approached one industrial estate. Uh, everybody knows that. They come to this industrial estate, but due to KPI, other industrial areas in Malaysia itself pinch these investors to their areas with better offer. So this is some sort of competitive about each other in Malaysia itself. We do not have a coordinator to coordinate the KPIs among all IDs in Malaysia. As a result, we have double we have complete amongst our, ourselves in Malaysia and also internationally with all the uh, investors in the group. So uh, that is our, our, our problem actually in our place uh, in the industrial estate. Probably you can comment on that. Thank you. It um, are in itself um, part of the reason why there is all of this in internal competition. 
Um, the second element uh, when it comes to the KPIs, um, the a KPI should be set in order to trigger performance and it should then measure performance. A KPI should not be just a reporting tool um, that um, creates internal competition. I think if we set smart KPIs, if one of the KPIs would be how well have I managed to generate a return on the investment in the land, um, then the internal competition is not so much um, to try and, and bring in clients at the lowest cost possible. No, then the competition will be how do I make sure that I price my product to the extent that the investor can bear that land price on the one hand side and price my product to the extent that I recover part of my investment and that I can, can actually justify the link between the original investment in land and development and operating and uh, the charges that I put in the market, the price that I put in the market. So I agree with you that indeed it's very difficult in a market where there's large oversupply to, to set attractive prices uh, because there's a tendency for all the industrial states to, to step into that game of uh, internal competition and that immediately creates that downward spiral on, on, on pricing. Um, so we should, we should correct that situation and once we are in a situation that uh, internal competition on price only is no longer just there because people want to get rid of their, their free land that has been sitting there for too many years unutilized. Once we get rid of that situation, I think the KPIs should be set in a way that actually they, they trigger similar type of reflection as we would see in, 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 in any other type of business. Use your resources to the best extent possible and put your resources in the market at a price that they allow for you to generate a decent return and at a price that actually you are a good solution to the, to the inquiry, that you are the, the best possible location. Then that probably needs some coordination um, in, in the way the country positions the availability of land and in the way um, the country goes about um, creating new land or, or revitalizing or redeveloping uh, existing land. But uh, ultimately, smart KPIs, I think, can help to make sure that uh, we're not just reporting on uh, capital uh, attracted or, or, or jobs attracted, but that we're actually also reporting on um, performance of uh, industrial land development in itself. Okay. Uh, we need, uh... Question that you said, uh, quantity-wise, statistics-wise, there's oversupply. So that brings to the need of so redesignation of those industrial uh, estate or industrial land, vacant, you know, or undeveloped. So probably those areas not so in good demand, they have to redesignate, maybe for housing or for other uh, purposes, you see. And in certain uh, areas or new area like this uh, Sarawak Samalaju, where we are developing new uh, energy intensive industry, which will give put all the full financial support to develop the best infrastructure to attract all those uh, new investment. Now even in the Klang uh, Kapa area, uh, there is a developer, they are converting all the residential land into this uh, industrial land. There is a uh, uh, Sungai uh, Kapa Inda there. That shows that certain area, there is a uh, big demand for industrial land. So we have to re do some redesignation. Yeah. Sure. It's a small clarification. Uh, uh, first, I'm quite uh, insightful with the report. The ideas the professor gives. I was just wondering, Professor, if there are one five hundred and ninety industrial estates in the country which has been built, constructed from nineteen seven early seventies to the present, and twenty years from now you never know it may grow also. Uh, this number one, I thought my observation my comment would be number one, this will build and plan and develop because of different needs and different objectives of different era. I mean, in the good old days, when we go, when we talk about uh, industrialization via export substitution, import substitution of export uh, land and things like that. I think those were the reason why those industrial estates were done. Um, and when, when, it, when it was done, the other <coughs> state follows the follows and then break it. But anyway, that's besides the point. My point really is, if we have that category, uh, 500, can we categorize? I know it may not be in your study, but can we categorize this? 
into the peak and the, the medium and the lower. Because I'm thinking of the European League football. Yeah. Eh? The big ones, you know, the top European League foot clubs are in the top league. So many of these industrial estates in the top league, the Bayern the past, the, uh, uh, those in the Selangor. And I think even in the case of Sarawak now, when we're talking about Samalaju Industrial Park, Mr. Ong is very very. We are not developing an industrial park for industries only. We are developing the industrial park for urban development to cater for an incoming 50,000 people. So it actually is beyond industrial park. Can, can I have what is the clarification? My point is, can it be categorized? Yes, we, 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 there will be a scoring system. No, no, I, I, I'm only commenting. If you don't mind, the chairman, chairperson, I just want to ask whether it can be categorized or not. If it cannot, never mind. For reasons that when we are planning in my, in the score area, we have Tanjung Manis which is different uh, category of industrial estate altogether. You see, that's why I mean by categorization. So we, we need to know what, what are the, the specifications of this industry. And in fact, in the third one, we are developing a place called Muka, which is actually a bit of a service center. And if we go into the hinterland areas, we go to resource-based industries like pulp and paper and things like that. This cannot be right in the city center. That's my point. Can it be categorized so that we can use lessons from this? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. I very much like your comparison with the classification and the top league of football um, teams. As I said, we know there are, or we are told, there are five, nine, five industrial estates in this country. Um, because of a number of parameters, we selected 112 to analyze and we found information on 39. If I want to categorize the top league in Europe, I have to know the name of the teams, which players are in the team, how many goals they have scored in the past, whether there will be any new players coming up soon. If I don't have that information on the teams, I cannot categorize. Our number one conclusion, and if you want, as was mentioned, a shocking conclusion is the lack of information. Definitely we should categorize. And probably in the past, a number of industrial estates have been developed for very good reasons. We, with a team, not only of PricewaterhouseCoopers, but only with lots of support from the public sector, we were not capable of bringing together the information that is relevant to an investor. And we really spend a lot of time and effort in trying to do it. So, is this the truth? Yes, this is the truth. Because if an investor comes, whether he's Malaysian, American, or European, he will also try to find that information. But very rapidly, when the information is not available on a certain team, how good the team can be, he will no longer think about the team because he has no information. So I agree with your remark and your view that we should classify, but I want again to ask attention for our number of one finding, there is a lack of information in order to, amongst others, do such a classification. Okay, I think I will have to... Uh... ...initiation of new industrial states uh, being followed by development, then a go-to-market strategy, and uh, ultimately elements that are related to the oper uh, operations and the maintenance of the industrial states. We think that um, there's an element of um, review an element of planning that now should really uh, take place um, with intelligence being gathered on the industrial states and uh, with um, a good understanding of um, the current supply and how the current supply actually uh, um, is in line with uh, the requirements of the market as we see it today. We think there's, there's planning to be done and I agree on some of the suggestions and comments um, that that planning may involve exit strategies for some of the um, industrial states or, or may create opportunities for redevelopment towards uh, more commercial, re residential or um, other type of uh, use of uh, the, uh, the current uh, industrial state. <coughs> but this planning and review should then uh, actually be followed by a go-to-market and that go-to-market should really be capturing all the, um, the, the elements that relate to the product development and, and the realignment of the product to the needs of the market. And um, with, with intelligence on these elements, with a, with a clear uh, understanding of where we want to go and how we want to go there and how we want to position 
in the international perspective, there should be redevelopment and further development. Because clearly, it's not like the, the, the days of uh, new industrial estate development are over. There will be a continuous need for new development. Um, it's, um, it's always uh, the situation that the demand side evolves and that industrialists will have uh, changing views on what they want and what they need because the technical process uh, changes, because the market changes, because the logistics and the supply chain elements change. And as such, there may be need for uh, specialist new industrial states to be developed. But ultimately, uh, development and redevelopment will have to go hand in hand. And also the, uh, the operations and the management of uh, those developments, um, they, they will see a uh, continued importance. But in terms of the, uh, the recommendations, as I said, the recommendations are on five dimensions and, and they go across the policy, attractiveness and management um, um, views. The first recommendation is very much to make sure that we going forward to match demand and supply. And um, we will create uh, a number of tools to do so and I will explain them uh, shortly after this slide. The second uh, recommendation has to do with the, uh, the finance and strategy. Um, the, um, the changing view from um, funding into financing and the opportunities that it creates and, and with financing and with financial performance um, there's um, audit and monitoring that, uh, that comes into place um, which actually means that uh, we will start measuring in a better way we will start, we'll start measuring in a, in a more consistent way and therefore be able um, to identify best practice and to be able to identify a room for opportunity as said, there's, uh, there's marketing, marketing including promotion, and then we think that uh, in terms of the attractiveness uh, dimension, there's a clear opportunity to there, there to do a, a more extensive job, and uh, we make recommendations on that level. And then ultimately, we talk about park management as being one, um, a, a bit of a burning platform, a bit of an, an element of concern that uh, is been identified um, with the different tenants that we discussed. So um, if we move forward, uh, these recommendations are not just uh, um, at, a, um, at the report level, no, they're not just uh, in text, we also will create the tools and, and, and the supporting um, um, assessments that uh, will allow to do this, uh, to, to transform or to implement these uh, recommendations in day-to-day uh, um, -day life. And uh, the tools will, um, will be a number of them actually. We see a database, and database is a very uh, simple word to say that we will have to collect more information, better information, uh, accurate information, not only on what we have today, but also on where we want to go and um, what the market is requesting, so that uh, whatever we develop or redevelop is uh, exactly what we want. There's a physical model, which is um, a definition, a, um, um, a, a, a depository, if you want, of elements which we think are uh, typical elements in terms of the physical, technical um, supply and uh, how we make sure that uh, by using a typology over uh, um, a number of dimensions, we, we actually make a more consistent um, uh, view and we make a more consistent concept of uh, industrial estates. There's the financial model which will be used to test uh, performance against uh, against uh, a number of uh, criteria. And then there's obviously the funding application process in itself. It's not like funding has uh, disappeared, um, but uh, in terms of funding, we want to bring in an application process that uh, is uh, consistent and that's actually easy to use. In terms of the demand supply, um, there uh, we say, well, we need to understand the demand better and uh, we need to make sure that we know how the current supply um, positions and, and based upon that we need to understand whether it is 70 years or 140 years or those 50 plus billion um, ringgit in value, uh, how they really uh, position in the market and how we can make sure that uh, we redevelop, realign where, where needed um, and then actually we bring a balance again, we bring an equilibrium in terms of uh, demand and supply. In terms of the, um, the financing strategy, I said I think there's a, a clear, clear fleet here uh, that private financing is the first and preferred option now for uh, industrial states. We want to make sure that uh, we create a situation whereby we are competitive, um, competitive from an international perspective, at the same time competitive um, to what we see uh, to be in private sector development. But, at, uh, but we want to do that using the principles which the private sector would use 
other words, we want to make sure that uh, we do the calculation based on proper analysis, based on intelligence and understanding of the market. Um, and if we do so, private uh, financing is, is a, a, a medium, is a tool to actually overcome um, the timing aspect of uh, our outgoing and incoming cash flows. But public funding will remain. That's a, a, clear, uh, a clear statement. The government will remain involved in industrial state development. But we will do so for the strong cases. We will do so for those uh, developments, for those situations where we feel that breaching that 30%, which we've been using in our example, is, um, is the right thing to do. And there's actually a, a rationale from an economic development or industry policy perspective um, to do so. If we uh, move forward to the uh, financing framework, Tom will give you uh, a bit of insight on, uh, on how we think we want to do this going forward. Yes, uh, good afternoon, good morning. Um, indeed, our assessment has revealed uh, the need for uh, this industrial estate development strategy that really supports uh, the economic uh, uh, objectives of the Malaysian transformation and impact um, but the strategy must provide a long-term framework for industrial uh, state development, um, where we recognize indeed the importance to find the equilibrium between okay, what is top-down planning and what are the uh, bottom-up initiatives that are entrepreneurship coming from local and state uh, governments and private developers. Um, that's why we put forward a framework. Um, um, they starting from bottom-up initiatives, so there is no ex-ante prioritization of funding, or there's no uh, top top ten of industrial estate to receive funding or the not. Um, the funding framework is really uh, bottom-up. It means good applications with a good business case, um, showing that they understand the market, right pricing, and they have a, a well-elaborated business case. Who, um, but still need funding for uh, for the ground macroeconomic reasons. They can uh, they can be eligible for funding. So that is the the center of the framework, um, where the objectives um, of this framework go okay, to avoid uh, oversupply of land, uh, to maximize uh, land value, um, and taking into account competitive pricing, so that means in your business case, in your funding application, the pricing policy will be taken into account, but you have uh, you did your homework um, and you uh, assessed the right, the right pricing uh, potential of your industrial estate. Um, this should lead to uh, industrial estates which are financially sustainable in the long run, be it with funding or without funding, Definitely, over the lifetime of the industrial estate, you must have you must show that you have taken into account different capital expenses and uh, operational expenses and maintenance costs, etc. Um, ultimately, this will lead to a more objective uh, funding, a more structured uh, way of uh, allocating funding. Um, and the process, as we see it, will be more transparent for all people and all uh, industrial estates involved, um, which will lead to uh, uh, taking into account clear uh, criteria uh, and also uh, transparent uh, monitoring later on uh, when the funding is granted. Um, so these are the main uh, principles of the, the funding framework. Um, to put this framework into practice, there will be a formal application process Marina will explain how we see uh, the ideal situation for such a funding uh, application process. Thank you, Tom. This process, again, is um, for those who are seeking government funding, not just grants, but you're looking at government support in terms of loans, guarantees of soft loans and everything. And this funding application process is benchmarked with EU's funding principles so here we talk about five main uh, steps. First is to look at its completeness of the application. So uh, this is to encourage uh, the industrial estate developers, operators, 
or those who are maintaining the industrial estates, the management, to have the information at hand, you know, to understand what are they developing, to understand how their past performances are, and basically to support their funding application going forward. Step two is where we'll be looking at the business viability. This is where the industrial estate will need to present their business case um, in terms of uh, what would they be offering, what is their target, uh, what is their strategy plan going forward. Again, like Dr. Anwar mentioned, industrial estate is like a business as well. So you need to think about your revenue, you need to think about your cost structure, you need to think about operating and maintaining over the life cycle of the industrial estate. You need to uh, move away from the mindset that developing industrial estate is just a real estate play where we just develop the infrastructure and think about selling the land. But you need to think about how we service the tenants, how do we keep the investments in Malaysia, looking at the different competition that is coming from all around the region. Step three is where, um, we, after assessing step one and step two, the business viability, we talk about whether uh, EPU would fund or not fund. And step four, EPU would determine the funding options, whether it can be grants, whether it be soft loans, or any other forms of uh, funding or support. And step five would be audit and monitoring. So if we go to step two, business viability, uh, we, as, we have developed two tools in terms of the physical and financial model that will serve as a guideline to all industrial estate developers and managers uh, to ensure the financial sustainability of the industrial estate. This would trigger some questions on the funding applicants, also to the, uh, to the PU or those who are giving out the grants. So the uh, Tom would help explain what we meant by the physical model. In order for um, EPU to assess uh, the funding applications and also for uh, applicants to assess which type of infrastructure investments are indeed eligible for funding, we have uh, defined some um, physical models for different type of IDs. Uh, currently, these are only defined on a strategic level, so on a high level, and I think uh, during the course of the implementation, um, there will be a more uh, detailed uh, definition of the typical requirements of different uh, industrial estates. The idea is um, to avoid um, the uh, amount of funding for infrastructure uh, investment or investment in uh, peripherals which are not really core to the industrial estates and are not actually um, needed uh, for government funding, but could be indeed classed in, on a cost-based or um, So for each of the uh, industrial estates types, we have defined minimum characteristics, like say, which could define the level of capital investment needed. Um, and this includes indeed the definition type of activity size, um, the general physical conditions, infrastructure requirements, zoning, um, the, the common facilities, uh, the image and the visual field, etc. Um, for now, these are just guidelines to assure, say, a level playing field uh, for the different industrial states and to, to reach a, uh, a common understanding of which uh, investments are eligible for funding within a uh, funding application for which are not really core core business of the industrial estate development. I think Marina will explain the financial model characteristics which is uh, provided. As mentioned earlier, one of the tools that we developed is also the financial model. The financial model template has been developed to ensure a standard calculation methodology for a business case and funding gap. We will encourage every industrial estate to have their own feasibility studies, market research. I understand and I acknowledge that most of the newer ones have already done a lot of their homework and a lot of their research. But I think as uh, for EPU to assess the applications, there needs to be a standard calculation and methodology in terms of definition, what should be included, what will not be included. 
So the financial model uh, has been developed and there will be a clinic session given to the government agencies later on. Main items that are involved in the financial model are looking at the capital expenditure cost, looking at the revenue, operating costs, as well as maintenance costs. With this financial model, it will encourage the developers to not just think about developing industrial estates, but also how would you maintain and operate these uh, industrial estates. So you need to think about the cost. Um, we shouldn't be relying just on the local councils because their scope may be different. Their infrastructure maintenance scope may be different. What is your value-added service that you're giving to your tenants? That is the mindset that we're giving uh, to the industrial estate developers and managers. The main output of this financial model would be the NPV of the project cash flow where you will see the sustainability of the project itself. Now, if, if you can justify there is demand and that the demand can actually cover for the, can actually generate a lot of revenue to cover your future costs, but you need some initial funding right now just due to timing, and then that would be a good business case. So we're not saying that you know, nobody gets funding anymore. But we also acknowledge as the government body that certain projects are needed for the economic development of the nation. And it may not be profitable, that's why the government is there. So there will be an output calculated based on returns on investment, based uh, returns on investment on public funding. The other, uh, the other outputs will also be the value added generated and the employment generated. The value added generated and employment generated uh, calculation has been agreed uh, and uh, done with the macroeconomic section of the funding. We also, for, for EPU to decide whether to fund or not, there will be several criteria that have been developed for the different industrial estates. For new industrial estates, for redevelopment or expansion, or for maintenance. So these are the criteria that uh, the industrial estates manager need to fulfill or provide in order for EPU to make the decision. <coughs> One is, as mentioned, looking at the market feasibility, uh, looking at the business case, whether that if the project is feasible, the project is viable. Looking at no oversupply, just looking by the location uh, on a case by case basis, whether in that particular location are there enough of such industrial estate offering or are they not. Looking at the funding gap, if there is no private financing available. Looking at the pricing of your land, financial sustainability, looking at the GNI impact. Efficient use of resources, looking at how you procure the transparency of procurement. Effective use of resources, going forward, how would you monitor? Management structures, which means that um, you need to include how your plan, what are your plans in order to operate and maintain your industrial estate, not just development. And then it will also be used as a ranking criteria, so based on past performance for the older ones, the urgency and strategic fit for the newer ones. Step four, there will, uh, EPU would actually rank the industrial estate funding applications based on these criteria, based on the limited budget that we have. So this is a, it's not a very straightforward process, but um, in this way, EPU would be able to rank and decide on how much funding to give with the limited uh, budget that we have. And on the step five, when funding is actually given to the industrial estates, uh, there will be a monitoring of industrial estate performance. And the agreed upon conditions would be given to industrial estate developers based on the funding that has been given. This is to ensure that there will be transparency in clear process code and procurement process, that we actually thought of a robust mechanism on revenue and cost tracking. You know, how would you collect your revenues? How would you uh, operate? How would you maintain? How would you up, uh, upgrade if you need to? How would you serve your uh, tenants? And this is a way to evaluate long-term sustainability. As Jan mentioned, this KPI is not developed just as a reporting tool. It's actually to help you uh, gauge where, where your strengths, where your weaknesses. And EPU or, or some of the government agencies would look into those KPIs that are unfavorable 
and look at ways to improve that. It may not be because of infrastructure, it may be because of business environment, it may be human capital development, it could be SME uh, development as what we found from going to some of our industrial estates. So I think these performance indicators is not to serve as a penalty system uh, in its entirety, but also to look at ways on how to improve on a case-by-case -case basis and on a periodical basis as opposed to waiting for it to have a bigger problem five years down the road. Then our next recommendation is also about audit and monitoring. We would like to uh, recommend that audit and monitoring be uh, practiced amongst industrial estates, developers and operators to encourage transparency and performance improvement. When I say audit, I think it's not just about financial audit, it's about technical audit as well in terms of how well we have uh, the, uh, the infrastructure has been given, whether it, it is actually performing, it doesn't break down, you know, it's meeting its um, service levels. We look at utilization of funds by considering value for money options. Consider if the IE are eligible for future funding. So with periodic audit and monitoring, uh, the government would be able to see on a yearly basis um, or on a more con uh, regular basis whether future funding will be needed and encourage review of market dynamics as we all acknowledge that the market conditions is very, very fluid. We need to understand um, how the, what the market wants and how we can help uh, be more dynamic in terms of industrial estate development. Are there any recommendations then? Yes, I mean, the other uh, recommendation that we made that has to do with uh, the marketing, and um, you will recall uh, the part of this slide as being the introduction where we said, well, this, uh, the investor's point of view, and this is how investors look at your country, and ultimately these investors are the tenants of the industrial states. So if we want to uh, position in the market and we want to make sure that uh, we actually capture more uh, investment than we track, uh, or tenants, uh, potential candidate tenants to our industrial estates and show them the wealth uh, of land that we have, uh, then we probably would do uh, uh, a better job in, in, in the marketing. We've seen that in the marketing, um, not all the material that is required at the different stages of the process uh, is available and um, a, a, a more tailored approach towards marketing and, and, and trying to understand how we can address the needs and, and the inquiries of the uh, investors at the different stages of their uh, uh, process is uh, what we try to encourage here. Um, and um, as I said, the process often starts by um, a, a country assessment. Investors will look at different countries and they will try and understand whether countries make better sense or make no sense or, or seem to be very attractive for them. Um, and this is really, really where it all starts. It doesn't start at the industrial state level, no, it starts at the country level. Because unless Malaysia is in the list of uh, countries that uh, are being assessed, no industrial state within Malaysia can ultimately become the final location of choice. And in the, in the marketing uh, process, we therefore have to go over country marketing towards area and region marketing into industrial state marketing. And um, probably different organizations um, today are involved. Um, we see industrial estate developers themselves creating uh, marketing material. We see MIDA being involved. Uh, there's different organizations that do parts of, uh, of, of, of the corridors, for instance, and, and the states will do their part in, in the marketing. Uh, and the only thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we use the, the material available in the best possible way. Intelligence is available in the market. It's just that we need to, to, we need to bring it together and we need to make sure that if the industrialist is considering countries, we provide him readily available information on country level that allows him to decide, yes, Malaysia is the right place to continue in my research, then probably he will go down to a more state or corridor level, and at that point in time, we need to trigger him, and we need to make sure that we get all of his attention, we get all of the data on his project, and address those elements which are critical, and then only later on, we have to make sure that we propose to him the industrial states which seem to be best uh, making best sense and we need to do so based on intelligence so that so ultimately we can price uh, according to his bearing capacity. This is in a nutshell the different phases that uh, we think the marketing uh, should uh, should include and, 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 and it should be built on uh, readily available information, it should be built on intelligence uh, with um, 
marketing uh, officers in, in, in industrial estate um, um, intelligence. So to make sure that we provide as uh, per the needs and at the time and with the timing of the needs. Because also that seems to be one of the elements that with the, um, the fact that the information is scattered across the landscape, it's very difficult to bring it all together within a timely fashion. Just the example of collecting information on the 112 industrial states and then only being able to collect sufficient information on 39 industrial states seems to be evidence of that. Um, but the industrialist is not going to wait. He's not going to say, well, I got all the, uh, the competing information. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait for another month to get all of it on Thailand or on, on Malaysia or on any of the other countries. And only then I'm going to make my decision. No, most likely he already has an agenda and we need to make sure we fit in that agenda in terms of timing, in terms of accuracy, and in terms of level of detail um, of the information. And we need to make sure that we put forward that kind of information that really allows us to be attractive and that also really allows us to be cost competitive in terms of industrial estate development. Ultimately then, once we've brought in the investors in and we've made sure that he feels comfortable in the industrial estate, um, at the time of uh, his site selection decision, we also have to make sure that he stays uh, pleased and that he feels uh, welcomed and being uh, looked after. And, and that is done by doing good park management. And that uh, is probably an element where our recommendation will say, look, make sure that somebody is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, which includes maintenance. But also let's make sure we don't look at our industrial states in strict isolation. Let's make sure that uh, we know our regions, we know the business environment of uh, the industrial estate, and let's make sure that uh, we develop human capital in line um, with what is really happening within the industrial estate. Let's make sure that uh, we create the opportunities for uh, further development at SME level and, and for uh, involvement of SMEs in um, the activities that are taking place within the industrial estate. And let's also make sure that we continue to talk to our industrialists. I mean, the difficult part is to bring in the industrial activity um, from, from, a, from a greenfield perspective, to bring in the first element of investment. The easy part should actually be to grow any of these uh, activities, to, to make them uh, um, continuously invest in your country, to, to, to add in, um, job creation and to add capital investment, and therefore to add the importance of Malaysia in, in the global footprint of the industries. But that can only be done if we continue to work with them and if we actually continue to capture their views, um, their needs, and make sure that we address them in the, in the right and the proper way. Ultimately, um, what we see is that um, there's a number of positive outcomes. And um, one of the, the positive outcomes at the park management level should be that um, the, it, it increases the overall quality. Um, therefore, it impacts on the ease of doing business and um, it enhances the industry's uh, operations. And, and a good plant manager is the best ambassador of a country. Um, it's, um, it's, it's that person that will tell any potential candidates coming in and doing their research that uh, he uh, finds it very attractive to, to be operational in the country, that, that he got all the elements that he needed, that it all nicely lined up, not only at the time of the decision, but also at the time of operation. Um, a park manager, therefore, should take ownership and um, he should be held accountable, um, which means that if, if as a, an industrial state development organization, we make somebody responsible to do the day-to-day -day operations, that we also should have a clear agenda on what the role and responsibility of that organization, that person is. Um, and ideally, um, a level of professionalism and expertise uh, should be put in there probably also an element of uh, economy of scale. An economy of scale is now probably best reached by bringing together a number of industrial states in terms of their park management needs and to make sure that we have an organization probably at the state level um, um, that actually looks after as many as possible industrial states to make sure that uh, we provide the service as needed by the tenants of that particular industrial state but also to make sure that we learn from the experience we have in one industrial state and, um, and grow that in the others. Um, and on top of that, it, it definitely helps to, uh, to in, uh, enhance the, the bargaining power of the, uh, the park management organization, having more um, uh, control and, and, and having more activity uh, within their portfolio. Ultimately, all of that will have a positive impact on the financial self-sustainability because we feel, and that is really the experience that we have talking to tenants in Malaysia, but also talking to uh, industries around the world, 
that good service can come at a good price. And, and therefore, there's additional revenue streams available um, for uh, the industrial state development organizations. I think those, in a nutshell, um, are the recommendations and those are, are the, the tools and, uh, and, 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 and the instruments that we want to bring to the table and which we've elaborated on in the report. Um, if we wrap it all up, then actually we see a number of elements um, that impact uh, on especially the financial uh, sustainability but also on these other elements. We have twice already commented upon the relationship of the price of land of the invested estate and the potential for return on investment for the individual project and the fact that that return on investment should be higher in Malaysia than anywhere else. We have handed to you the equation here that you can use in order to number one, be the winner, and number two, to concentrate on those industrial estates where the equation is such that you are close to bridging the gap or bridging the gap in time, and then to decide for those where there is a gap to be bridged, which ones should be, to what amount it should be. We cannot enough emphasize these two little equations that we really should look at. Now, we have looked at industrial estates and we have looked at uh, industries that want to invest into your country. Let's compare it to the process of a number of consumers who want to buy a new car. And therefore, they walk into the showroom and they want to decide which car they want to buy. They have their own criteria. Some consumers want a family car that sits five people. Others want a two-seater convertible that above all impresses the neighbors and is really fast with a heavy engine and so forth. In this work of industrial estates and of industries on the other side, we have looked at many things. We have found many things in described them in summarizing conclusions. We came with a large number of very relevant recommendations. However, when I try not to give the summary, but to give a summary of some important things. For example, the consumer who walks into the showroom says, this car has a crack in the rear mirror crack in the rear mirror, mirror should be fixed. But also consumer may say, here I find the car that has only three wheels instead of four, or five wheels instead of four. That's much more important. Or here is a car with an engine that is too light. All of a sudden we find a car without an engine. So therefore, the three remarks I'm going to make now is not the summary of the summary. The summary of the summary you've got throughout the morning. I want to come to the difference between the crack in the rear mirror and there is an engine missing. You see here our final wrap-up findings and things of which we say you really should pay attention. And again, the first one is the lack of information. There are thousands of cars on the parking lot not all of them are represented with models in the showroom. Not all of them are represented with models in the showroom. Not all of them even have a brochure that can be handed out to the consumer that wants to make a decision. That is the number one thing. And it should be amended because it is needed for internal policy making, it is needed for strategy, it is needed for not for putting the best money to place in the best situation but it is also needed to convince the industrialist to come with his investment to a Malaysian industrial estate. That's number one. Secondly, and this morning it was mentioned, please, we invite you to really read the full document and it will take up a weekend. That's not true, it will take up two weekends. 
And we have not gone into some of the arithmetics that are in the report. But the second very important finding is that Malaysia many times offers industrial estates to industries in such a way that it is a very good product, Malaysia, as a location for investment, priced at a very good price. It is not the best product, it is not the Rolls Royce, it is not the Bentley, but it is many times a very high quality car and very fairly priced. You know, in, when, I meet, uh, in West, when I meet industries in the United States, in Europe, Japan, uh, the talk of the town is China and the development of China and investing in China. When you go through the details in the report and through the arithmetics of return on investment potential, Malaysia, and so on, you will see that uh, many times you are far better positioned than China in order to attract people. And therefore, uh, we, we want to, a little bit, because of the many remarks we have, you may have the impression that we are very critical about what we see, and we are. But number one conclusion, there is some information missing. You know, the first conclusion, in fact, which I now address is number two conclusion, Malaysia is an excellent product for Indian investment and for Malaysian investment because there is no difference in what in Malaysia, and at a very well fair price. And the number three, and, and by the way, by the way, separate remark, there is an upward potential in your price. So you are very good, very reasonable price, and you can even make more money. And the last one, the very last one, is Jan talked about marketing, and you know there is different uh, definitions of marketing, uh, but to put it in plain English and in simple words, marketing are all those things you have to do in order to make the sale process as simple as possible. Marketing has to do with improving your product, putting the right price on your product, making sure you sell your product in the right place, and so forth and so forth. That's marketing. The third conclusion is, Yes, you should really pay attention to your marketing, but above all, you should pay attention to the last element, which is sales. You definitely should start up a very aggressive sales program, whereby you bring the good news that China is a wonderful country, but that you are better qualified to attract investment than China with higher operating quality conditions and at a fair price. And the sales, in contrary to marketing, where you talk about uh, where you talk about using the website, where you talk about advertising, so sales in this field has to do with face-to-face -face conversations with industrialists where you prove with facts and with figures, with facts on quality and with figures on dollars that you are indeed a good solution for this investment opportunity. And again, those three remarks is not the summary of the summary, those three remarks are three remarks of which I say, when you looked at everything and anything, it's all important, you should address all the findings you should check whether you agree or disagree. You should check all the recommendations. Check whether you agree if we are disagree. But never ever forget those three things that we just <coughs> mentioned. One, information. Two, it's a very good product at a very fair price, but not everybody knows about it. And three, start selling. Start selling in Malaysia, but also start selling in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Japan, Germany, Bayern, and so forth. That is what I wanted to say in final conclusion. And I thank you for your presence and your attention. And I thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I cannot sum up better than uh, what uh, Fred has, has uh, you know, said. I mean, the, the three important points I, I try to reiterate again information, information, information. 
Um, second is, yes, Malaysia is a hidden treasure, but we are not selling it, you know, as well as we could. We are, it's a hidden treasure. We have good land, we have good um, conditions, good uh, business conditions, but we are not packaging it well enough. Third is, we need to get our act together and really sell it and not sell it individually and, and uncoordinated, but sell it as Malaysia. So I think uh, we really need to, to um, put our, our heads together. As uh, uh, we will, the report will be um, uh, um, distributed or given to those um, uh, who, who used to have it once we have tabled it to the um, steering committee, which uh, we will table on the 29th. On, uh, on Thursday, and then uh, we will also table it to the investment committee because uh, the investment committee is waiting anxiously for us to, to present um, this report to them. And uh, I'm not sure whether we will have to table it to the EC or not, but once uh, that has been cleared, then uh, uh, the report will be available for public consumption. But having said that, uh, following this, um, uh, uh, the steering committee and so on, we will organize a training session uh, for um, uh, all relevant parties, uh, the park managers, uh, uh, the state authorities, the local authorities and so on, uh, to really, uh, because uh, as Fred mentioned, there's a lot of mathematics, uh, there's a lot of calculations that we have. There's a lot of work, of work that has been put into this uh, two volumes of report. And we really need to understand how they derive at all those um, uh, numbers and conclusions, how they rank the, uh, the uh, industrial estates and how we calculate cost, quality and so on. So I think uh, we will have a, a one-day training session and our uh, uh, the, the, um, the consultants will be, uh, the, uh, will be you know, doing the training for, uh, for you. So, um, I think, um, I think with that, with that uh, recommendations, can I get the feedback? I mean, there are five um, key recommendations that we have put forward. One is on the demand supply. I think we have to move from a supply-driven uh, build and come to looking at the real demand and seeing what the investors' uh, needs are and developing things that the investors want. So that's the first one. Second is the financing strategy. How do, you, how do we make sure that uh, industrial estates once developed is financial, uh, financially sustainable? Uh, what sort of um, strategies, uh, you know, uh, how do we get private investors to develop industrial estates rather than uh, government, uh, totally gov uh, depending on the government? We can have uh, public-private partnerships, which we have not really tried in industrial estate uh, um, uh, development, so we could, you know, explore those possibilities. Uh, the third is um, the third strategy is uh, audit and monitoring. Very important. I think going forward. Um, uh, we will have, I mean, with the very limited resources that uh, that we have, we really have to look at performance. 